Des, we're talking about the abomination of desolation. I mean, what a doozy of a topic. Um, makes me think of the abominable snowman. And I think for, for many Christians, it's about as relevant. I mean, it's not something that you, you go and hear, uh, hear a message at your local church about very often. I mean, why is the abomination of desolation important to know about? I mean, why, why is it relevant at all? Well, I could speak for hours on this, but let me try and sum up the essence. Mm -hmm. Twice in the New Testament, Christ quotes from the book of Daniel in uh, Matthew 24, 15 and Mark 13, 14. And in both passages, he makes it very plain that there'll be a final antichrist who will project a tribulation such as never was. And unless God cut short the days, the elect would be wiped out. And then he gave the key of a command. Whoever reads the book of Daniel, let him understand. So Christ has given us a command. It's one of his many commands that we ignore. That We need to understand yes. the book of Daniel. And interestingly, our Lord summed up in a few phrases the essence of the book. Because in Daniel, you have villainous kings like Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar who are idolaters, profane, murderers, who typify the abomination of desolation prefigured by the prophetic symbols of the little horn, the nasty little horn with eyes like the eyes of a man who up, throws up powers and wears out the saints and defiles the church of God. And Jesus is saying, at the end of time, Daniel's prophecies will be consummated. They've had minor fulfillments through the ages. The biggest one is yet to come. As you well know, the company to whom he spoke also saw a fulfillment. When the Roman armies came against Jerusalem, they had idolatrous ensigns on their banners as they approached the temple. So was that the abomination of desolation? Yes, that's one fulfillment. So oh, now, now there's... Let me go a bit more slowly here because I can see you've studied this for a long time. So the abomination, you're saying that the abomination of desolation is not just mentioned in the book of Daniel. It's not just this, this concept or this phrase stuck away in the book of Daniel. No, no, no. Christ alludes to it twice. And John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 22 and 23, mention the Feast of Dedication, which to the Jews was the commemoration of the cleansing of the sanctuary mm -hmm. from the dep depredations of the abomination in their day, who in their day was Antiochus Epiphanes. And when Paul writes 2 Thessalonians 2, he quotes from Daniel 11.36. Daniel 11.31 onward is all about the abomination of desolation. And Paul quotes from it in 2 Thessalonians 2 about an apostasy just before Christ returns. Then we get into the last book of the Bible, Revelation 13. Again, it uses the imagery about Antichrist setting up an image like Nebuchadnezzar set up an image, like Antiochus Epiphany set up an image in the temple. Mm -hmm. So you have Matthew, Mark, 2 Thessalonians, Revelation, all of which are repeating imagery from Daniel, which has had minor fulfillments through the ages whenever a desolating, idolatrous power counterfeited the gospel and attacked the people of God, had a fulfillment, but it's had its main fulfillment at the end time. And the one we've discussed about AD 70, when the Roman armies with their pagan ensign came to desolate the temple, Christ's warning saved hundreds of thousands of lives, those who listened to the apostles that said, get out, get out. The Antichrist, the abomination of desolation is coming and Millions of people are going to die. So, so Des, if I can, just because I, um, I'm going a bit more slowly here. If, so you're saying, it's not, you're telling me it's throughout the New Testament. Yes. And, and Jesus commands us to, to, understand under, it. to understand it. And that word understand is found 30 times in the book of Daniel alone. That's the marvel. Christ took key passages from prophecy, abomination of desolation, from history, understand and he put them together. He said, make sure you understand, Daniel, because it prefigures what is to come as well as what has already happened. So I'm, so it seems to me this is something Christians should understand. If we're should. Christians, we've got to do what Jesus commands, for starters. That's right. Now, 
it seems to me that, uh, because I'm getting confused, Des, here, I mean, I mean, what is the abomination of desolation? You, you're talking about the abomination of desolation as if it's different things. You're talking about it back in Daniel, and you talk about Antioch, Antiochus Epiphanes, and you're talking about uh, the, the, end time. The, the Romans, you know, in yeah. AD 70 when they attacked Jerusalem. And the end time. You, you mentioned the end time. Um, I'm, so I'm getting confused here because I like to think that prophecy is simple to understand and that, you know, one, one thing, one symbol or one phrase has one meaning. Sometimes it has more than one. Take the first prophecy about the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Mm -hmm. God will put enmity, he says to the serpent, between thee and the woman, between your followers, seed, and her followers. And one particular follower, he, shall bruise your head, but you shall bruise his heel. Mm -hmm. First fulfillment, next chapter, when the seed of Satan, Cain, kills Abel. When Paul came along, he said the final fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 is when Christ shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly, Romans 16. So here's the first prophecy of the Bible has recurring fulfillment wherever there's a clash between the false gospel of Satan and the true gospel ah, of Christ. So this has to do with the gospel. Oh, yes. Well, then that makes it very important, doesn't it? Very important. Now, I've heard you say, Des, um, that, that we need to understand uh, the end of the world and prophecy through the lens of the cross, through the Passion Week. Yes. I mean, maybe that will help me understand this abomination of desolation well, thing. Well, the sentence, abomination of desolation, standing where it ought not, standing in the holy place, is found in the Olivet Discourse given by Christ on the last Tuesday of his life. So this is right in the heart of Passion Week. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is, key phrases in this sermon are then taken in the story of the passion of Christ that follows it. So you, you have several of the key phrases of Christ that occur in that thing. So what he's saying is this, what is about to happen to me on Calvary will happen to my body, the church, at the end of yeah. time. Yeah. And remember, he says that. Remember, he had a betrayer. He had an antichrist in his flock. Mm -hmm. Someone who linked together the civil power of Rome with the apostate religious power of Judaism. So they took hold of Christ in Gethsemane and then put him on a cross. What Judas did in linking church and state back there is according to the book of Revelation, what will happen when the final Antichrist manifested in history will be a union of bad religion and bad government opposed to the gospel and to all who preach it. And this final Antichrist will have a false law. He writes it on their hands. And remember that's from Deuteronomy 6 where God said, yep. write my law on your hands. So Antichrist will have a false law. So put on your hands. He'll have a false gospel. Yes. He'll have a false worship over and over in Revelation, particularly in chapter 13, use the key word of worship. The word worship in the Greek means to kiss the hand, to kiss the hand. So the final book of the Bible is saying what happened to Christ is going to happen to his body, the church, in the last days. There'll be an anti-Christian power that poses as Christian, claims to have a gospel, claims to have a new law. But if you don't fit in, you'll be murdered. So, so what, you know, as, as just a Christian who goes to their local church, um, what should, what's the importance of the abomination of desolation? What should they look out for, you know, in terms of the gospel? Well, where they should start is, what's the meaning of this phrase? And if they use any concordance, they'll find the word abomination is used over and over again in the Old Testament for false gospels. It's not a good word. For false worship, for idolatry. Mm -hmm. The biggest sin in the Bible is not murder. The biggest sin in the Bible is not adultery. The biggest sin in the Bible is not theft. The biggest sin in the Bible is idolatry, putting anything mm -hmm. before God. So abomination means idolatry. Mm -hmm. And just as Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius were types of antichrist and they were idolaters. <coughs> Desolation means persecuting, mm -hmm. oppressing, make desolate. All the way through Passion Week, 
all of Christ's sermons, all of his parables are about judgment. And he ends it by saying, your house is left unto you desolate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So abomination of desolation means an idolatrous power that persecutes and oppresses and lays waste as the Romans did with the temple. Because what I don't want to do as a Christian is um, understand that the abomination of desolation is bad and that it uh, involves a false gospel, a counterfeit gospel, and then, you know, I, I wouldn't want to do this, but I go around calling people the abomination of desolation just because I don't agree with them. If I understand the meaning of the words, I've got to dodge everything that is ahead of God, everything that's idolatrous, and I must dodge everything that's not of love, hate, persecution, desolation, is everything that's not of love. So if I'm going to take the primary warning, I must flee from anything that's idolatrous, anything I put ahead of Christ, money, reputation, pleasures of the flesh, anything I put ahead of Christ is an abomination. I've got to shun that. And then I've got to shun hate, contempt, evil criticism. I'm not to desolate the character, the reputation or the person of other people. If I do that, when the final abomination of desolation mm -hmm. comes, the final form of Antichrist... Which is this union of church, church, and, church state, and state. When they are secularised, well, we'll trying be, religion yeah. is the only thing to cure the world's ills. Yeah. See, the world's tried technology, the yeah. world's tried education, mm -hmm. they've tried war. Nothing has worked to solve the ills of the world. They'll try religion, they'll claim a gospel that will do it, but it'll be a gospel elevating man, not God. It'll be an idolatrous gospel. And if we, and if we haven't shunned abomination, if we haven't shunned desolation, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be primed we'll be sucked in. to be sucked in and support that, that thrust yeah. which will basically be a thrust against Jesus Christ and his gospel, That's it. which is a gospel of, of love, of, uh, of saying, come to me, yes. not, not of forcing people, no, not of no. manipulating people. For anyone that's interested, there's a little book I've written that tries to sum it all up, The Coming Worldwide Calvary, that's available through Good News Unlimited. You know, I've read that book. Oh, I don't hold it against you. It's a good book. <laughs> I'd recommend it. I think we better leave it there.